Sacred space is very important where you get a feeling that this is a dedicated space to worship. And when we're dedicating ourselves to worship, we feel a sense of presence of God. Obviously we can pray everywhere and God is everywhere. But being able to stand here in fellowship with everyone around raising their hearts at the same time makes the space very, very important. I think what amazed me was just the beauty of a very simple, a new building. It, it, it was the freshness and the clarity of the decoration as much as anything else and the beauty of those um, pictures. I loved it. I think um, the one thing that took me aback was the blending with the old and the new. The one thing that strikes me, particularly with um, this church, is since it's still sustained its core tradition. One thing we don't ever move on is dogma or theology. Mm -hmm. But in terms of life and practice, of course there is evolution. So for instance, we use a lot of English here. We don't just use Coptic language uh, because that is something that we can change. Uh, the form, you know, the plasma screens, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, not, they're not very traditional, but, but they're part of the means of getting the message across. This, this is very interesting because in many ways it is typically Egyptian in the whole style of the, of, 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 of the place. And yet, you've got a man there who, who is clearly concerned to make sure that the, the liturgy is done in English, it reaches a, a different sort of um, congregation, that it's talking to young people. I mean, the point is here, uh, the issue of sacredness, is the issue of sacredness, it's, it comes from, you know, generally speaking, from the people, do you know, who will designate it's the people and their attitude towards place will make it or what they do in this particular place will make it sacred so in islamic tradition really any place can be a mosque with um, when muslims where they want to pray we talk about beauty beautifying oneself yes. there's also this idea of beautifying the mosque as well and the way to actually beautify many mosques you'll normally find inscriptions of the quran you can see it over there yeah up right up I mean, if you were to go to Regent's Park as well, you'd find inscriptions of the Quran everywhere. You do have the pulpit, and the Imam comes up and actually gives a sermon, faced towards his congregation. Yes. But then, when you doing the when they lead the prayer, they're normally praying towards, um, you could say, a wall as well. So well, it's praying into the the Qibla, which the Qibla, is of course yeah. pointing which towards point Mecca. Yeah. The, 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 there is a significance in the, the architectural structure of, of, of churches. Our churches uh, traditionally would point to the east, uh, liturgically because we await the coming of Christ from the east. We don't have uh, an equivalent of that, but the synagogue does point, preferably in a particular direction, so that all of the worshippers are facing Jerusalem. The stone that the building is built on is called Jerusalem stone. It's a particular kind of limestone out of which Jerusalem is built, which is why it's called Jerusalem the Golden, because it glows beautifully in the sun. And, uh, and, and it's very important and special that this synagogue is built of Jerusalem stone. When you go to Jerusalem and you see you're surrounded by this golden stone, and particularly you're struck by the walls of the of, of the temple, and uh, the link between that synagogue and Jerusalem obviously is important for a Jew, but even for a you know a cradle Catholic, suddenly realizing the links, the physical links between this place and Jerusalem and me as part of all this, I thought, yeah, this 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 is. I don't know what it is about the sacred places like that, but they link you together and make you part of a much, much bigger world. For, for the mosque, the central focus is the, the, the Qibla, pointing towards Mecca. It's, it's, it's always towards Kaaba, yes. Kaaba, yes. if everybody's worshipping at the same time all over the world, yes. 
that everybody is pointing towards towards, towards Mecca, towards, towards Mecca yes. which is wonderful symbol of the unification of, of the of the community of the Ummah. My question to ask you: Where is the focus in any sacred space? In the Catholic Church, it's the altar. Yes. And in a Hindu temple, you know, the sanctuary is going to be the sacred center, which is for most Hindus, you know, the point of pilgrimage. In a Protestant church, the center would be the pulpit, where the word of God would be proclaimed. Well, the pulpit is really the most prominent feature of this church. Um, and its prominence tells you a lot about what is considered important within our mode of worship. And that is principally the Word, the Word of God as found in the Bible. So during the sermon, he would be up there in the pulpit. And from that strategic spot, the minister can communicate with everybody. Remember in the other Church of Scotland, Church in London, there was a visit from some French people. And they came in and they admired the, uh, the white spacious building and said, but where are all the saints? Indicating the empty walls. And the reply was, come on Sunday and you'll see them sitting in the pews. Regarding the first mosque, which was, which was in, in Medina at the time of the Prophet, it was a place of worship, uh, it was a community center. Of course, the issue of, of the, as a community center, it was really the focal point of the early Muslims, it was the mosque. So most people assume a mosque is just a pray, place for prayer. Mm. Whereas, um, from my reading of history, they used to hold so many different activities. People used to come here to discuss matters um, families just bring their children in. It's a more of a community centre. I think I feel very um, optimistic about the Al-Minar Centre. So it's actually going back to the idea what I feel a mosque is really all about. It's more of a community. It's more of a community. Like the women are doing yoga now. Yeah. I was I mean, thrilled to see yeah, them I mean, coming in. If we were to walk around upstairs, we'll find that there is um, another conference room upstairs. Yes. There's another conference room on the other side. Brilliant. And there's also a library here as well. The community centre remains very important um, in, term, in terms of for, for synagogue and it has different functions, communal functions, uh, school, place for small children to be educated, a hall. All of these are a part of the, the sort of synagogue campus. The synagogue temple distinction is one that's often struck me as interesting when I go to different churches, yes. in fact. Um, there are temple-type churches with altars and places where only special people can go. And there are, you say, your Welsh nonconformist chapels, which are more like synagogue-type churches. The Methodist Church was not just something that people came to on a Sunday morning. It was something that they came to during the week. They had women's groups, children's groups, uniform groups. It was a central part of, of their lives and it was great. And unlike other, other denominations, the Methodist Church was built with a small chapel area but lots of other rooms where people could engage in other activities, both youth, elderly, uh, middle-aged, females, everything. It, covered, it became a central part of the community spirit that their faith is exhibited through action in the community. That, that's more true of Methodists than I think of any other denomination. They're phenomenally good at it. So at one end of the spectrum, people will say that the expression of our faith is what we do with other people outside this building. So the building might not matter too much because it's merely the starting point. And others will say no, our faith begins with worship, because it is in worship that we establish, continue and celebrate our relationship with God. So what we do in worship is tremendously important, and because it's so important, we give very strong importance to the building in which the worship takes place. I started on the course, 
and we visited some Hindu temples. I really had a personal struggle with the murtis and the images used in the context of religion and I felt acutely uncomfortable going in a Hindu temple. Uh, I just had to force myself and to a lesser degree seeing the icons in the church. But I think now I have an appreciation of what their role is and a better understanding and a respect uh, for the use of these images in, in a worship context. I think it's got something to do with the way in which we encounter God. Um, I think for Catholic Christians particularly, there is this idea that you use all the senses and therefore God is not just to be heard, God is to be sensed, uh, God is to be seen. There is, a, there is a visual representation in the pictures, in the icons. There's virtually no statuary in this church, but what we do have is this set of four windows, each with nine panels. So here in this first set of nine, we've got people who were important in bringing religion to Scotland. Moving on down here, we've got more biblical scenes. And then when we get to the third set, we have figures from national life in Scotland. And right in the centre, John Knox, who was the principal character in bringing about the Reformation in Scotland. These pictures have no uh, function in the way that an icon has. They are just illustrative. In synagogues, firstly, you will find no representation, visual representation of God, although there can be uh, uh, natural images. I really like that synagogue because it's it's, um, it's a breath of fresh air, almost like it's very open, it's modern, and it's free of images, yet it's very decorative. So this is a modern uh, sanctuary um, that was designed um, in, in the 1990s. It's the largest liberal congregation in Britain, and this is the, the desk, it's called the Bima, from where um, the services are led and rabbis give sermons and so forth and then the scriptures are read from the uh, upper desk. Now, how are the um, Jews encouraged to create a religious space around themselves apart, away from the synagogue and into their daily life? Well Judaism is very much a religion of daily life and particularly focused on the home uh, because that's where so much of the emotional um, side of the Jewish religion is kept. One important thing, very, very important, is the candles for Friday night. Um, we have silver candlesticks. In most households, you'll see two silver candlesticks like this. Now, these candlesticks are very special to me because they're passed down from my great-grandmother. Actually, they're from my great-great-grandmother. She passed them to my great-grandmother, Rebecca, who had 11 children. She passed them on to my grandma, Lily, and she passed them on to her only child, my mother, who passed them on to me. The reason we've you know, got these lovely things like silver candlesticks, silver goblet, and this special cloth that I'm gonna cover the hollow bread with is because the Sabbath is so special and because it's a bride Sabbath, we, we, we show it our finery. So we dress in nice clothes and we offer it these, you know, lovely things. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam. The, the use of things in the actions there that are daily things, the use of bread, the use of the wine. You know, we do that as, as Catholic Christians when we come together. But I think what struck me is that it was done in, in, a, in a, a domestic setting. For myself as a Christian, I, I tend to go out to other places to have that kind of sharing, uh, to take part in those kinds of symbolic actions. And the woman especially playing such a key role. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Bertie Vonu, La Havnik, Nershal, Shabbos. Good choice, Johnny. No, I'm out of here.